Hello the internet and welcome to my channel. Um, on this video I'm going to test, diagnose, repair I guess um, this motherboard. It's a um, Shuttle 591P. Uh, it doesn't really say Shuttle anywhere to be honest but there is actually a fine 91P here. Uh, it was sold as a Shuttle and um, everything you know, I found the manual online, everything matches the shuttle version. I'm quite curious why some of these old motherboards, they don't really have the brand on it. Um, some do, um, some don't. I'm not entirely sure why. But anyways, again, this 591P um, seems to be the version, the, the model of the of the motherboard. It's um, super, it's not socket seven, it's a super socket seven um, motherboard. Uh, which supports um, a large variety of processors. Um, I found the manual here and I can see it does support, I can see the support for um, Pentium MMX, uh, Pentium, normal Pentium, then you got um, AMD K5, which I guess is the purpose of the super socket k6 k6 3d cyrix ibm and that's it and this i dtt c6 which i don't know what that is but anyways and you know i can see frequencies going from um 90 megahertz to at least here i can see to 233 megahertz um so yeah, it seems like um, yeah, quite a quite an interesting board. Quite an interesting board, as as you can see, I've got ISA slots, PCI slots, AGP slots, um, uh, HDD, um, ID one and two, floppy. What's that? That's the floppy, and what's that? Hmm, good question. Well, let's find out. <laughs> I didn't notice that. There is a schematic here, so let's take a quick look. So that is floppy. Oh, parallel port? Yeah, parallel port connection. So that's parallel, uh, of course, yes. So um, ID, ID, floppy, parallel, um, serial serial and there's also a USB connector there's a USB there's an infrared connector which are here on the board so that's the USB that's the infrared um, so it's quite it's very interesting to be honest it, it's it's probably I would say it's a good candidate for like the definitely ultimate uh, retro gaming board at least for my personal use uh, it, it's got um, dim sockets for RAM and also SD RAM sockets and also AT power connector and ATX power connector which you can select by uh, there's a selection here with JP8 so it's the other way around but JP8 and this jumper here basically selects whether you're using the ATX or the AT um, power connector. So it, it, it's, it's pretty it's pretty nice. I really like it. And um, the reason I purchased this board is it's, it's sold as faulty. And the cause or the failure is the usual bulge capacitors, as you can see here. Basically all these uh, bigger capacitors, which are, uh, if I'm not mistaken, 1200, 1200 uh, microfarad, 6.3 volts. Um, they basically all bulge all around the board. So I've got some spares. You can see here, everything is bulged. It's not, I don't see anything massive leak uh, or anything uh, completely wrong, but definitely, I mean, they're not supposed to be like that. So what I'm gonna do with this board, I'm gonna test it first, see what works and what doesn't, and then I'll go and replace, go ahead and replace all the uh, capacitors. To be honest, all of them, including the small ones. I know there's probably not much point in doing it, but since I'm replacing the faulty ones, I've also ordered some, some of the small ones. To test these boards, I'm going to test for the first time 
my uh, trusty Intel Pentium. It's a 90 megahertz processor, which I purchased some time ago as a, for nostalgic reasons. I never had a Pentium 90 myself. Uh, the friend of mine had it, and he was, you know, it was a big event, uh, the Pentium 90 and, and all the hype around this processor, uh, to the point that I believe this friend of mine purchased one of the first bugged processors. Uh, there was an issue with, uh, uh, with the hardware, with the processor, and it was constantly failing a specific instruction. So I remember he had to send it back to Intel, and he received a new revision of the processor uh, for free. Um, this table, and also uh, the internet to be honest, is basically telling me that Intel 90 megahertz processor has a system clock of 60 megahertz, so the multiplier shall be set to 1.5x. Uh, the user manual is pretty well done. Um, obviously, to set the frequencies and voltages, uh, a number of jumpers will have to be set on the motherboard. I can see for the 90 megahertz um, Pentium processor, um, uh, we got JP1 to be set in uh, this configuration here. So the first one, two, three, four, five, six uh, jumpers are to be shorted and the others to be open. And there's also J26 and JA26 and JA27, which need, be, need to be configured this way. So looking at the motherboard, um, this is my jp1 so i got the first three jumpers in position and the other three um, uh, open and also we have here uh, ja uh, got 25 26 and 27 the manual only mentions 25 and 27 closed um uh, sorry 20 yeah 26 and 27 sorry closed um so these are open actually open well in this position um, it's not open or closed, it doesn't really, 2-3, position 2-3, there's a small 3 here. Um, so I've set those accordingly. Uh, I don't think there's anything that mentions uh, with JA25, so for now I've just left it as it is, right? as, it, as I found the board basically. Um, when it comes to voltage selection, uh, it's quite clever, it's this J19, uh, you've got this jumper ABC and position 1-2-3-4. And looking at the user manual, I mean, there is an automatic setting. So looking at the, again, Pentium 90, it basically says uh, if you short uh, position C and B on all four um, rows, um, basically it goes on auto detect mode. Um, if you want to do manually, there's a very, again, this is pretty well done. Um, the Pentium 90 is a 3.3 volt uh, processor. So basically, uh, in this case, I have to short uh, position uh, jumper A and B on position one, three, and four, and leave position two um, completely open. So in this case, uh, where is it? I'd rather go to a manual setting. Uh, so that's set, as you can see, position one, three, and four are shorted on A and B, and uh, number two is basically just um, it's just sitting there doing nothing. So that's giving 3.3 volt uh, to the CPU socket. And as you can see, the board actually comes with um, uh, instructions on the board itself, because uh, you've got all the voltages here. And you also have the, that's the that's the external, not entirely sure what that is, it says CPU external clock. Uh, I think it's something to do with the memory, I think the manual says. Uh, but you also have some instructions uh, where are they here for the multipliers so you can see exactly if you don't have the manual uh, handy you can see exactly how to set the multipliers so again in our case it would be uh, jp1 uh, 7 8 9 10 11 12 open 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 so as you can see uh, yeah they are the three the three which i found which i shorted here that's for the CPU external clock. Uh, I can also see a, um, this is a BIOS programming. Um, there's a selection for 5 volts and 12 volts. I'm not entirely sure to know what that means. Because uh, again, um, does that mean the board can accept two different types of chip BIOS? 
plus chips. Um, I'm not entirely sure, to be honest. I, I'll, I'll need to dig into that one. And as I mentioned before, uh, this little jumper here is basically selecting between the AT uh, power connector and the ATX power connector. I'll leave it to AT for the time being. Uh, now the manual says, um, in order to run this board, I need either two uh, DIMMs or one SD RAM modules. Um, um, I'm not entirely sure why on like, for example, a 386 or 486X board, I can only do with one DIMM uh, module. Is, does that have anything to do with the fact that this is a, maybe a 32-bit chip and the others were 16? I don't really know. I need to check if someone knows the the reason why I need two DIMMs in, in, in these wide slots, uh, sockets, uh, for the motherboard to work. Uh, please do let me know because I'm curious. Um, as I don't have two uh, identical DIMMs, I actually have only one, even, <laughs> not even different, um, I dig this um, SD RAM chip from uh, another old computer. Uh, this is a 512 megabyte uh, PC133 uh, SD RAM module. Now, this board does not support more than 256 megabytes, I think. Um, so I'm going to hope that basically the rest of the memory is going to be ignored. Um, if it doesn't work, uh, well, I placed an order for another one of my uh, 8 megabyte um, DIMM modules. So I can do 16 on this board. Um, but hopefully it will work anyways and, and we can test the board regardless. Okay, so let's start populating the components. Uh, I also see the um, BIOS battery is missing. So I can um, I can place a, a new one later on. Obviously, let's make sure the corner of my Pentium 90 matches the corner of the socket, like here. So I've got this corner here in this position. I think otherwise the the, the CPU just doesn't doesn't go in. And look. Okay, uh, then we want a video card. For the time being, I'll just use this old ISA video card with a VGA output. And then we want a power connector. I've added a new feature on this um, power connector. There's a green LED here on the 12 volts rail. With the resistor, of course, <laughs> which um, basically, uh, which basically, lets uh, green when um, when there is power. Um, you know, I think it's a nice addendum because uh, too many times I have been removing um, components while power is on, which is obviously not something I'm very proud of. Uh, let me find. I lost my memory module. Uh, so this memory module, uh, this. Seems here, now you can't see it, now I've got all the cables in, but this is slot one and this is slot two. So I'll start with slot one. Don't worry, I have a anti-static uh, wrist wrap. That's why I'm touching everything without think thinking too much about it. Okay, dokie. So memory is in, power is in, video card is in. I haven't got any hard drive or anything connected, just want to see what happens. Because uh, again, that, this board was sold as um, um, uh, spares and repairs. I know the Pentium needs a, um, a heatsink for the time being. I just, you know, I'm just doing some starting up tests, so I don't really care too much about about it. I keep an eye on it and make sure it doesn't overheat. At least I hope it won't. So I would say let's. Uh, oh, uh, my keyboard. I've got my keyboard here. There we go. Keep it here. So let's give it a go and see what happens. Okay, I'm good to go. Uh, I've just added um, a small buzzer slash speaker on the speaker output, just in case the bias has something to say, doesn't like something, which is very likely, because again, it's uh, supposed to be a faulty board. So nothing is shorting, nothing is touching. Let's keep an eye on the temperature of the Pentium. Let's give it a go. Three, two, one, go. Processor is warming up. Oh, 
Oh well, the board is definitely starting up. Okay, so that's uh, best, better than I thought. It actually sees the memory. The processor is getting warm, but it's still touchable. Uh, yeah, it stops at 200 and that's 256 now. I'm going to s remove power because the CPU is getting a bit too hot. Um, so kind of disappointing <laughs> that the board is working, uh, but I guess at least I can test it a bit. Um, so I guess my next step, I have a, I have a small heat sink here. I have a small heat sink here. Uh, it's roughly the size of the CPU. It's a bit smaller. I know this is not permanent, okay? It's just, uh, just for testing. So I just put a little bit of, not too much, not too little. Again, this is totally, totally temporary. There we go. So I can power it up again and hopefully I can play with it a little bit more. Uh, well, at this point, since it's booting up, let's um, let's plug the, the, ba the battery. I've got a new one here. There you go. Battery in and see what happens. So yeah, still booting up. Pentium S at 90 megahertz. Memory test is testing everything. It's a 591PWIQH Apollo MVP3 board. I think they're not sure what the Apollo is. That the manufacturer? Is that the chipset? I'm not sure. The chip, the uh, BIOS is dated uh, 18th of April 2000. You can see again 256 megabytes of uh, memory, which is again we have a 512 megabyte chip, so that's fine. Obviously, there are no floppies. Uh, default loaded because I've just put a battery in it. Uh, so I guess I can get into the BIOS, which is a standard. Oh no, I said it said continue, so obviously I didn't get into the BIOS. But yeah, I mean it's definitely booting up. We've got 512 kilobytes of cache. Uh, I'm wondering, um, I don't know, to be honest, is the, the cache on the board or is that integrated in the processor? Because uh, I don't see any removable memory chips. I'm just wondering, is it in the processor, maybe in the chipset, or is it some chip on the board which I haven't identified? I don't really know. If someone knows, please do let me know. Uh, it's quite nice. Again, I like this, the automatic... Um, hard drive uh, recognition at the, at the BIOS level, so you don't have to worry about too much. And yeah, it seems to be working, to be honest. So I would say, let's plug the hard drive in, which you can probably, you can, you can hear it running, but it's not connected. Uh, let's plug the hard drive in and see what happens. With my usual mess, I've got um, Fujitsu, I can't really see it, but it's a very old and a bit I would say a bit unreliable. It still kind of work. Uh, this is a MPA three hundred three five AT uh, hard drive, and I think this is um, is it just it's only a few um, gigabytes. Five AT. It should be a four three point four gigabytes. At least that's what the label says. I also have a, a DVD ROM connected, and the usual floppy here. So let's power it up and uh, and see what happens. Okay, let's keep the memory test. Floppy is seeking. Oh, ah, okay. Oh, I plugged it to the secondary by mistake. But yeah, there's a hard drive and 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 CD-ROM. It's loading MS DOS. Okay, seems to be working fine. Kind of disappointing. <laughs> you know, it's supposed to be a faulty board. Okay, uh, I haven't got much on this hard drive. I think I only have Doom. 
zoom on, on a pen tune. Oh, that's faster than my 386, 486. Yeah, definitely very smooth. And very fast in loading and doing everything. Okay. Well, it seems to be good. And the heat sink is, is warm. But it's, I think it's okay for tem as a temporary solution, it feels fine. Um, okay, so to be honest, to be honest, at this stage, there are a couple of things I want to do. Um, again, as a res restoration thing, obviously, I want to replace all the capacitors. Uh, at least I will start with the four, um, 1200 uh, micro, no, microfar, not microfar, yes. No microfarad. I will start with the faulty ones, uh, the bulge ones, uh, and then I think I found uh, this uh, latest BIOS version, so you can try and update the BIOS and and see what happens. Uh, I will also I will also will try to um, save a backup of the BIOS using my program. Um, again, it's maybe I don't know whether it's an old one or maybe it's the latest version or maybe it's even a newer uh, version. I'd be nice to. Um, make it available on the internet so for anybody uh, to download and use uh, if, if needed. To replace the 1200 um, microfarad capacitors this time I couldn't find the available the uh, Panasonic FR series so this time I chose uh, Nikikun capacitors as you can see 1200 6.3 volts uh, this is the BW series which i normally use for switching mode power supplies uh, to be completely honest with you i didn't realize i was ordering pw uh, i think they're fine in this case because again these are surely for smoothing um, main rails um, i think i think they're going to be fine to be honest but i appreciate maybe it's not exactly the perfect replacement uh, for a motherboard but i, I think it's going to be at least fine in this occasion uh, let me remove the battery going to be very paranoid in case I'm shorting something. Again, it's 3 volts. I don't think that shorting anything 3 volts will cause any trouble whatsoever, but yeah, it's a nice idea not to have any voltage running in the board when doing this kind of stuff. So there we go. Let's uh, give it a go. It will take a little while. So I'll speed it up and hopefully put some decent music for you. In, in, th in this part here, the board has a very uh, thick uh, ground plane. Um, I'm, I'm actually struggling to flow the solder with, with the soldering iron. Um, so I'd like to do that before trying the desoldering iron, which usually struggles more. So yeah, I guess it uh, may take a while. I'm keeping an eye on the polarity of the capacitor, but you can see the minus, the negative lead of the capacitor is where the white, um, how you say that, um, where it's not the dash there, but where basically this this pattern is on the PCB. And, and also you have a plus uh, um, symbol here. So there's just really no way that you can mix it up. So that's my the first one I've removed. This is slightly bulged. Um, I think I'll, I'll test a few of them at the end. I'm curious to see to see how they still perform. Again, 1200, 6.3 volts.
Okay, all the uh, 1200 microfarad capacitors have been removed. It hasn't been easy, uh, particularly um, in this area where, as you can see, there's, there's probably other layers underneath, but as you can see, there's a big uh, copper plate. So that's obviously, it's um, sucking away the heat from my guns. Before replacing them, I'll pull the other curiosity. I'd like to test a few to see. I mean, they must, they, they probably are not so bad considering the board was working. So let's try this one. The diet. Okay, so maybe. <laughs> Yeah, actually, okay, it doesn't even see the capacitor. Okay, so maybe <laughs> it was worth replacing them. Well, it was worth, definitely worth, because they're bulged. But maybe I wasn't expecting such a, such a massive failure. Oh, wow. Okay, fair enough. So maybe all this, this, this work was actually worth. Okay, well, definitely worth replacing. Let's check one of the new Nikikon capacitors, see what it says with, with this. Oh, okay. So I guess my tester here has a problem. Probably the battery is too low. It's a seven volts, which is definitely low for nine volts. Let me see if I can. Okay. Hmm. I'm wondering whether these uh, leads are actually working. So this is now powered from my main power supply. It says, as you can see, it says 8.95 volts, but it still says no part. So let's try with some better leads. Uh, actually, well, no, it's better this way. Again, let's go with the good capacitor hmm. okay it uh, looks like oh wait that's not connected <laughs> oh my gosh not doing well Okay, well, definitely looks like there's a problem with my tester. It's kind of weird. It was working last time. Let's try. Straight here. I don't think it would make a difference, but. Okay, that's interesting. Uh, 1134, which is totally fine. So weird. Um, okay. Anyways, we know about this. Problem is, I don't think I have, uh, I don't think the leads are long enough. Uh, maybe they are. Okay, they are. Totally there.
Okay, so it's half the capacitance and this ESR is 6.4 ohms, so obviously this is pretty bad. This is a bit better, but still not great. That's probably why the board is still working. I mean, the capacitors are not completely dead. Let me try and find the one that looks worse, which is probably this one. Yes, so they're still working, but um, again, ESR is very high and capacitance is uh, between a third and half of what it's supposed to be. So, yes, yeah, fair enough. That, that's that's why the board is still the board is still booting up. Um, but yeah, obviously, um, it's, you know, it's obviously a good thing that I replaced it. Uh, well, I guess I'll need to check why these two, well, my leads are not working on this one, but that's not really a big deal. Okay, so the next step is to um, replace the capacitors, and it may take a while because again, some of the some of the other some of the capacitors removed, they barely came out, uh, which means you know I, I wasn't able to suck away uh, the solder uh, the way I wanted because of the thermal uh, how can I say mass around the the the. Uh, the legs of the capacitor, so yeah, I'll do my best. It'll take a while, but I'm sure I can do that. So as I imagined, because I couldn't remove uh, all the solder from, from the holes, uh, now the capacitor's legs, they don't fit in the holes. So um, my first try would uh, was basically to add some, uh, some flax and try the, the solder wick to try and desolder the holes, but as you can see, that really didn't work. Um, and my uh, second attempt uh, was basically to, uh, you know, melt some solder under, under the desoldering gun and wait a few seconds and, and, and hope that that was enough to allow the desoldering gun to suck the solder. But again, that wasn't working. And reason is, again, there's a big um, uh, copper plate in there, several layers probably with copper, and, and that simply just didn't work. And I think my soldering gun was almost a maximum. So eventually I ended up with my, uh, firing up my SMD station, hot air station. I set the temperature of over 400 degrees or something, and I warmed up the, the surrounding of the, uh, of the PCV. And then I tried again with a desoldering gun. And as you can see, that actually worked, because obviously the rest of the PCV is now uh, warm enough so that the soldering gun basically doesn't have to warm the PC, the whole of a PCB itself. And um, and that worked for most of the of the holes. Um, some of them uh, took a little bit more time. Uh, so some of them I had to like this one, for example, you know, it's taken quite a lot of efforts. Uh, and, and on some I had to um, um, start my SMD station again, warm again the PCB and, and try again. Uh, but in the end, as you can see, I was able to um, remove all the solder and, 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 and start fitting the capacitors. Uh, okay, I'm, unfortunately, <laughs> well, thankfully I realized before soldering, I thought I checked that and I will double check on my order. Uh, I thought I checked the height of the capacitors. And as you can see, the ones I bought are much higher than the original ones. Uh, the problem is this. So obviously 
you won't be able to fit a board anymore on those lots um so <laughs> so i guess i'll have to uh, again i haven't sold it anything this is just uh um fitted in so i'll have to place another order for um different type of capacitor and um yeah <laughs> So I have to stop right now because I can't, there's no point in continuing right now. That means I can't, I mean, I could continue with this, I guess this too, but even this one is exactly in front of the AGP's lot. So yeah, I guess I'll just stop now and, and continue another day. So this is the following day and I, um, I kind of struggled to find a suitable replacement for uh, for these very small capacitors. Um, actually, the only option I could find was the FR series from uh, Panasonic. The problem with the Panasonic is it's the same diameter, but it's 15 millimeters, and this is 14 and a half. Now, unfortunately, the, how can I say, the, the, the socket here is exactly, well, is exactly 15 millimeters from the PCB. So 14 and a half for a capacitor, which is sitting uh, there, sounds perfectly fine. I didn't really like the idea of having a 15 millimeters, which is exactly the same height. So chances are uh, any boards installed in this lot uh, and this one as well, and this one as well, will end up touching, slightly touching the capacitor. I didn't like the idea. Um, Panasonic has, I think like a low profile, um, FR series, which is, I can't remember, I think it's 12.5 uh, millimeter. The problem is, it's then 10 millimeters diameter. And as you can see, some of these capacitors are very close to each other, and I found out 10 millimeters is not gonna work. So I was honestly about not to give up, but I really didn't know what to do. So eventually I found this, which are polymer capacitors. I don't know if they are still electrolytic. I think the electrolyte is, is a polymer compound. And as you can see, uh, these are 13 and a half or something like that. So much smaller than the ones I, I purchased yesterday. Uh, they are the same diameter or the ones that I'm going to replace. And as you can see, they are um, a tiny little shorter. So I think this is 13 and a half. Yes, that's about a millimeter difference. So again, um, they are worth, if I'm saying the right. They're a bit expensive, to be honest, but I really couldn't find anything else. Um, so yeah, this is it. So let's uh, let's move on and and see if I can finally recap this board. Okay, so all the um, well, the, the main faulty capacitors are, have been removed and replaced and soldered. Um, I think I've decided not to replace the small capacitor. It just takes too much time, and I, well, the, the, the very small one. Uh, but uh, yes, I am replacing the. Uh, these are the 470 microfarad 10 volts ones, uh, which again don't really show anything wrong. But again, I feel. Considering that most of the others were bulged, it's probably uh, it's probably a good thing to do anyways. It's kind of a way to kill time. So I have these Nikikons 
Mickey Cone 470 microfarad volts series uh, VY. Um, again, not what I usually get. I think I was constrained uh, to get the Nikki cones because of the size. Again, I uh, think these are basically exactly the same. Yeah, same height and same diameter. Perfect. So just out of curiosity, uh, I'll put the battery back. I don't, don't really know whether that's gonna work or not. But out of curiosity, let's try a new capacitor. Okay, uh, am I? Oh wait, that's uh, that's me because I'm on the same. I got both legs on pin one. So that's a new one, just to make sure that this thing works with the battery a bit below. Uh, 434, which is fine. It's a 470. Um, ESR is very low, so that's perfectly fine. Now let's see if I have legs long enough with this as well. I think so. So that's one I have removed. I'm curious to see because again, that doesn't show anything wrong. No, that's actually perfectly fine. Let's try another one. I need a new battery, obviously. <laughs> 129 ESR is pretty low. So yeah, it looks like, again, you never know what happens with an actual voltage. And maybe when they get a bit warm, it's, it's uh, again, I, I'm 477 is perfectly fine. So it looks like those were fine. Uh, but again, I'm replacing them anyways. I've removed them already, so <laughs> it's no point in... Uh, arguing whether I should do that or not. So again, I'll um, um, put the new ones in, solder them up, and then I guess we can uh, retest the board. Okay, all, um, at least the big capacitors have been replaced. So you've got these red ones, which were probably the, the only ones you actually needed replacing. And then I have the 470 microfarad 10, watt, 10 watts, uh, volts. Uh, again, um, I think I'm gonna leave the small ones. It's just taking <laughs> too much time, but uh, actually the, the uh, hot air method seems to be working fine. So let's give the board uh, a nice scrub. Okay, so I think everything is done. Last thing I want to do is to uh, quickly check the capacitor polarity. Um, now you can go one by one and, and check, for example, I don't know, this one, for example, you can see the hatched area, it's where the minus is, uh, which again, it only takes a minute. Uh, but one other way is capacitors on a board will likely, um, how can I say, the, the negative uh, lead will be probably pointing the same direction all throughout the board. So you can see this, this, this capacitor, these two capacitors here, they're pointing down. That's obviously, it's oriented in a different way, so let's ignore that one. But if I check this one, it's pointing down, 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 and down. So that's kind of a, and yeah, that's pointing right and right. So that's kind of a quick way to say, okay, everything should be right. Uh, I don't remember seeing boards where suddenly one capacitor is is oriented the other way around. And if I'm looking at the, uh, the black ones, it's down, 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 it's down. Uh, there's another one. Uh, down. And that was it. I think it was seven. One, two, three, four. Oh, and this two. Down, down. Five, six, seven. Okay. So, yeah, that's kind of a quick safety check to make sure capacitors are 
uh, oriented the right way and mounted correctly. Um, let's power it up and cross our fingers and see what happens. Okay, I'm ready to go. I hope I haven't I haven't made any mistakes, I haven't plugged anything backwards. Um, hopefully, even if that happens, it's just a capacitor blowing. It shouldn't really cause any trouble. But let's give it a go. Three, two, one, go. Okay, sounds good. Yeah. Well, it's booting up, which is great. Sorry, monitor is a bit... It's a very old and very tired monitor. <laughs> and it takes a while. For the lamps, this is no LED, this lamp uh, CCFL. So it takes a while to get right. And as you can see, it's very much damaged. And I didn't throw it away because I thought, yeah, I can use it here. Okay. So obviously we got the um, BIOS error, no problem. We can, well, I guess we can continue. Yeah, the hard drive is a bit tired as well. It keeps doing the seeking stuff before actually working. Sometimes it is throwing up an error. But yeah, it looks like uh, everything is good. As it was before, to be honest, I appreciate this, mo this um, uh, video is a bit boring <laughs> it wasn't really anything not working uh, so i don't know i mean uh, my usual doom test <laughs> everything seems to be working fine and uh I guess, to be honest, the, the last thing I want to do on this thing is uh, update the BIOS. I believe um, I believe this is not running the latest BIOS. Uh, I actually found a website, which I'm sure everybody <laughs> watching this channel knows perfectly fine. I heard about it, but I never visited it, and it's amazing. I mean, for this board, there are like seven, eight different BIOSes. Uh, all throughout the years, obviously. So I, I, I realized that the one I have is the not the latest one, but the one before. Um, so I, I could use my I could use my programmer, but I think I want to go go ahead with the um, normal procedure of just putting the BIOS on a floppy and just uh, updating it from MS DOS. And if something goes wrong, I've got the programmer, so it's not a big deal. Now, before running the BIOS, the updater. Um, if you remember, I mentioned uh, there's, um, let me show you, there's a, there's a jumper here on the motherboard, which, which says five volts, 12 volts. And according to the um, user manual, uh, this is basically selecting whether, whether the, uh, the BIOS chip needs 12 volts or five volts for programming. And you can see here, it says Flash EEPROM, JP5. Uh, the, man, the, the main board supports two types of Flash EEPROM, 5 volts and 12 volts by selecting, by setting up jumper JP5. The main board can use both 5 volts or 12 volts Flash EEPROMs. Now, the chip that is installed on this motherboard is an SSD 29EE010. And um, I, I, had, I just um, had a quick look online and um, it, it looks like it's a five volt chip, um, but the jumper is set to 12 volts. Now, um, I don't even know, because again, if it's a five chip volt, you can send the five volts everywhere and the chip will survive even if it's not supposed to have exactly five volts or whatever. But if you send 12 volts to a five chip volt, I'm not entirely sure it will like it. So, um, you know, I think, I mean, number one, I have a programmer, so if something goes wrong, <laughs> I can reprogram that chip. Uh, yes, reprogram the chip. But, uh, you know, I'd like to start with 5 volts rather than 12, because uh, worst case scenario, I guess it won't work. So let me, I'm not sure I can show you here, because or no, the motherboard is, is um, hooked up to all the uh, peripherals. But let me, well, there's not, nothing really I need to show you, but let me just move this to 5 volts. 
Uh, at least this is what the PCB says. Now the manual says, uh, where is it? Well, JP5 is, where it, where it says five volts is one, two, and definitely it's one, two close for five volts. So I don't have a one number. Well, maybe this is some sort of, I don't know, but it clearly says five volts. So let's suppose that the PCB is correct. I don't know, you can't really see much here. Uh, and, uh, and let's try and um, program this chip with the latest buyers from 2001, I think it is. So, right, so, so I got this file, uh, the BIM file, 591PS025, uh, which I understand is the latest version, 27th of uh, March 2001. And I have these uh, awdflash.exe. Uh, uh, so let me write down the file name 591ps025.bin. So let's run the um, awd flash. Uh, file name to program, which is 591. PS025 bin and I think it's going to ask me if I want to save a backup that's why I haven't taken a backup yet do you want to save BIOS? yes file name to save uh, 591p old bin and see what happens. Okay, so the backup has already happened very fast. Are you sure to program? Yes. Ooh. Okay, that's fast. Not date. Uh, verify flash memory. Okay. Write okay. No update. Write fail. Everything seems okay. Exit or reset. Let's try reset. Oh, it's interesting, it says flash type FSD 29EE010, 5 volts. So I don't know whether this 5 volts comes from the jumper that I set, but yeah, it's it's like, it seems like it's worked. Uh, F1 reset. Again, I see what happens. Well, it is booting and 27th of March 2001. So we do have the latest BIOS. Uh, it seems to be working. I'm impressed. If I get into the BIOS, maybe I can set the optimized settings. Uh, assuming, oh, it's just defaults. So let's go with BIOS defaults, yes. Save and exit. I think it's a good idea. Every time you um, upload a BIOS, new BIOS, even with new motherboards, to be honest, just to reset all the settings and go back. And I mean, this is really nothing I have done on this one. Okay, still booting, still happy. I think the latest BIOS is supporting some bigger hard drives. This was some that I found on the internet. Something I found on the internet. Okay. Okay, everything moving up. Let me my usual doom test yeah, still working and very fast as it was before so no issues here
and that the other way around. And this is the outcome. I'm wondering whether this is just the software, which is not updated for anything more than 486. Because I think uh, I tried another one and it says uh, 486. But again, I, I guess it's, pretty, it's perfectly normal. Okay. So the, let's call it repair. <laughs> that wasn't really a repair. I mean, yeah, those capacitors definitely needed replacement, but you know, the board was still working. Let's call it, I don't know, uh, restoring, refurbishment, tinkering, whatever, of the board is complete. Everything seems to be working. Um, it's definitely a very nice motherboard. I'm actually thinking of getting a case and make a, uh, a, you know, a system which is working and hopefully connected to my main monitors uh, on my desk. So every now and then maybe I can just uh, indulge myself into some no nostalgic moments. Um, Sorry, maybe it was a bit boring. It was nothing really interesting on this board to see, but again, it was nice to, uh, at least for me, it was nice to go back to these old, old things and see how things used to work and you know, do some soldering work and, and things like that. And, and again, it's, I'm happy now that I have a Pentium 90 system working uh, in my collection. So um, thank you very much for watching and uh, I hope you you enjoyed the video uh, feel free to leave any comments below um, leave a thumb up if you liked it and um, and see you next time